So we're now going to look at the second part of our Chapter 5 lecture on um, the electrons and where they're located. And to understand where electrons are located, we have to understand the behavior of light because the two are connected um, uh, almost interchangeably. So in about the 1600s, Isaac Newton, who you know for his famous, you know, understanding the laws of physics as we know them, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, that's the guy. He thought that light consisted of a stream of particles. But Maxwell, in the late 1800s, thought light was more like a wave traveling through space with a connection, a continuous wave between all parts of the wave. And Maxwell was able to calculate the velocity or the speed of an electromagnetic wave. And electromagnetic waves, as I mentioned in a previous podcast, could be anything from teeny tiny gamma waves up to um, radio waves. And he found that in a vacuum, the speed or velocity of one of these electromagnetic waves was the same as the speed of light. So over on the left-hand side here, what we're looking at um, are ways to think of light as being either continuous or discrete. So some say light is like a wave. Some people thought it was more like a particle. But in fact, the most modern theory that we embrace to understand the behavior of light and also of electrons is that it has duality. In some ways, it does act like a continuous wave, and in other ways, like a particle. And we'll come back to that and develop this. It's kind of a ooh, sort of far out there kind of notion to grasp at first. So, Max Planck said that the light that we see is consisting of little bundles of energy called photons. So the word quantum represents the energy that one bundle of light would carry. <clears throat> but a lot of people use the word photon and quantum interchangeably. Quantum is really the energy and the photon is the particle of light. Quanta is plural of quantum. And the energy that each of these photons of light carry is directly proportional to the frequency. Let's go back and refresh our memories. Wavelength is how long the wave is of the light or any kind of electromagnetic radiation. And frequency is how many pass by you per second measured in hertz, which is one hertz equals one wave per second. So if you have a high frequency, you must have a small wavelength. And that's why things that have small wavelength, like X-rays or gamma rays, have very high energy and can do lots of damage. So this is our quantum theory, that each quantum, each bundle of energy, is a specific amount of energy. And you can impart energy to electrons, we'll start making that connection, by zapping them with energy. In our first lab that we did on the flame test lab, we put our atoms of various elements into a Bunsen burner and gave our electrons energy that way. Or, as we'll do in a future lab, when we do the spectroscope lab, we'll give the energy to the electrons by zapping them with electricity. But the bottom line is, when you zap electrons with electricity, they absorb these bundles of energy that we call quantum, for a single, and quanta for multiple. Now let's go back to understanding light again. I think you've all have seen a continuous spectrum when you looked up in the sky and saw a rainbow. So we have that Roy G. Biv, the red, orange, green, blue, yellow, indigo, violet. I think I got the order wrong, but the rainbow. And notice that all of these colors in a continuous spectrum blend into each other. But if I take sunlight, and I pass it through a glass prism, then what you see broken out instead of white light is this continuous band of colors. And notice very carefully if you look at them, each of the colors seems to correspond to a particular wavelength of light. So that's our continuous spectrum. When you pass white light through a prism, the reason we call it a continuous spectrum from red to violet is one color blends smoothly into another. Here's another image of that. Take a moment and take a look at this because these are upcoming quiz questions. 
I hope you can notice that the violet light is being bent the most and the red light is being bent or refracted the least. If we pop back to that picture, not real great imagery, but you can hopefully see that the violet light has a shorter wavelength than the red light does. And that's got to do with why the violet light was bent the most and the red light was bent the least. But all of them get bent. Much as you would see like if you look in water and you reach for something that's in water and yet it's not there where it's supposed to be, that's because the water bends the light just as a prism will bend the light. So what we've come up with, and this was shown to you in a previous slide, we learned that frequency and wavelength are inversely proportional to each other. Frequency times wavelength equals the speed of light. The speed of light is a constant, so if frequency is large, then wavelength had to be small. If it's a really, really small wave, then a whole bunch of them can pass by you in a second. Well, this next equation is a famous equation. The work of Max Planck and Albert Einstein led to this equation. If you wanted to figure out the energy in those little bundles, if you wanted to quantify the energy in those bundles of energy that we call quantum, or quanta, then all you need to know are a couple of things. You need to know the frequency. Now remember, that's that Greek symbol nu, and old books and sometimes old worksheets use F for frequency, but we're going to use this symbol. It's not a V, it's a Greek symbol nu. And this is a new guy. This is Planck's constant. Uh, it's spelled P-L-A-N-C-K-S, and Max Planck, as you can see up above here, it's spelled correctly, came up with a number that connects the amount of energy in each of these little bundles of energy to the frequency of the wave that they're passing through space in. Now it's a really, really small number. It's 6.6262 times 10 to the negative 34. That should be a capital J, joule second. It means uh, a frequency is measured per second then the amount of energy is measured in joules. So this number, h, is kind of like pi. It's a constant. It's a number that doesn't change. Pi is used in geometry when you're figuring out things like circumferences and so on. Well, the Planck's constant is used when you're calculating energy. And if this number, h, Planck's constant, never changes, and this number, frequency, gets larger and larger, now you have a direct proportion. The energy of one of these bundles of energy is directly proportional to its frequency. Big frequency, big energy. That's just the opposite of the inverse relationship between wavelength and frequency. Now let's follow that through. I want to go back there and finish one last thought. Let's follow that thought through. So if wavelength is really, really small, Frequency is really big, and if frequency is really big, then so is the energy. So very tiny wavelengths like gamma rays have very high energy because their wavelength is so small and their frequency is so large. Now we'll finish up one more section here on the PowerPoint notes, and we'll discuss in class when I see you next. When you look at the continuous rainbow, that shows all of the colors of white light that blend smoothly from one into the other. But what we will be doing, or probably have done by this point, is a lab where we're going to look at the bright line spectra. And when you heat an element and look at the colored light that is given off through something called a spectroscope, or in our case, all we used was a really simple, super thin kind of prism called a diffraction grating, you get a characteristic set of lines that's unique for that element. And they look something like this. Now I want you to notice that it's no longer continuous. See the dark spaces between each of the bright lines in this emission line spectra? It is a not continuous spectrum. And we're going to connect these bands of colored light and their wavelength and frequency directly to where electrons are located relative to the nucleus of the atom. So let's take a closer look at bright line spectra. When you take an electron and get it excited, so you're looking at some atoms 
and you excite the electrons in the atoms maybe by zapping them with electricity or heating them in a Bunsen burner, you get the electrons into an excited state. Now I'd stand up here, but I think I'd probably go out of, uh, out of focus, so you'll have to just trust me. As I look at this tube here, which contains a gas, notice it has electrical leads on it. It's been zapped with electricity. There's nothing in there but the gas, and it emits light, which you can pass through a kind of prism-like device, like a diffraction grating, and it bends the light, and this time, notice, we have individual bands of light that are separate from each other. And each of these bands of light corresponds to a different color. And as we learned in a previous slide, you have long wavelengths associated with like red or orange light and shorter wavelengths associated with like blue or violet light. So the wavelengths are bent at different angles and they separate in one of these line emission spectra or bright line spectra. Now, when you put that energy in and an electron gets excited and jumps up to an excited state farther from the nucleus, it's like me trying to stand on one foot. I'm not very stable. I'm in a high energy position and I really want to put my foot down and come down and get a much more stable position. Well, electrons do the same thing. You can make them bounce up, but they can't stay up there. And when they come back down, meaning closer towards the nucleus, closer to their original ground or unexcited state, they give off energy as photons of light. So in this tube, gas atoms are getting excited. They reach a higher energy state. They can't stay there. They come back to a lower energy state closer to the nucleus, release photons or quanta of energy in specific wavelengths, which correspond to specific colors on this line emission spectrum. Here's another shot of that. Notice that if you are looking at energy being given off from a substance that's not passing through like a prism, you get the rainbow here, the rainbow effect. So if you saw white light. And there's different kinds of spectra. This emission spectrum is the one that we're going to focus on. Light being emitted as excited electrons return to a ground state. So now if you think about it, we've just got done watching that video on fireworks and hopefully you can understand that the beautiful colors of fireworks come from the fact that you put different elements into each of the exploding shells. And the different elements all glow with a very own unique color because the different elements all have a unique number and arrangement of electrons outside the nucleus. So lithium gives you the beautiful reds, or you get blue-green from copper, or green from barium, or reds from strontium. That's where our fireworks come from. You get the electrons excited in the chemicals that are inside the shells, and as they come back to a ground state, they release the energy in beautiful colors of light. So that's a good spot to stop. We will continue to explore how light is connected to the very important experiments that determine the location of electrons around the nucleus, but we'll pick that up on next section of the PowerPoint notes when we cover the electromagnetic spectrum.